Welcome to How Brands Are Built, where branding professionals get into the details of what they do and how they do it. I'm your host, Rob Meyerson. Thanks for listening. Today's episode is brought to you by Squad Help, the world's number one naming platform. To use Squad Help and launch a naming contest today, go to squadhelp.com and start receiving custom name suggestions instantly. Today, I'm joined by Ken Pasternak, president and COO at Marshall Strategy, a brand identity and strategy firm based in San Francisco. Ken is the strategic lead on major positioning, identity, naming, and brand architecture work at Marshall. He's worked with clients like Apple, Symantec, MTV, Boeing, Sony, and UC Berkeley. I've known Ken since 2007, and through the years, we've partnered on quite a few naming and brand architecture projects. So it was great to talk to an old friend and colleague who also happens to be a brilliant brand strategist and hear more about how he thinks about brands and brand experience. Here's the conversation. Ken Pasternak, thanks so much for joining me. It's good to be here. Thanks, Rob. So your bio on the Marshall Strategy site says you have a diverse background in writing, education, music, film, television, and digital. I also know you have a degree in American literature from Harvard. So I was hoping we could kick off the conversation just hearing a little bit about how you got from American literature into the world of brand consulting. Yeah, thank you for the question, Rob. When I was in college, I probably had no idea that brand consulting was a thing. And in fact, I was really kind of a generalist in college. Um, I did academics, but I also did sports and I did music. But I was a creative person. I was interested in fiction and in filmmaking. And I thought I might have a career as a writer or as a filmmaker. And as a matter of fact, out of, out of college, I moved to Europe, mostly to reconnect with my Hungarian roots. Uh-huh. But I had the good fortune of eventually joining a successful company there that made industrial films cor- for corporations. Because at the time, there weren't any Hungarian companies that did that because they'd just come out from under communism. And this was in Budapest? This was in Budapest, Hungary, yes. Yeah. So that was a bit of an extension of my, my passion. I can call it a storytelling passion, really. Mm-hmm. A couple of years later, I showed up in San Francisco, and through a, a network at Harvard, I got connected to a firm that was called Frankfurt Balkind. And among other things, they were experts in, in brand strategy. The San Francisco office where I landed was led by Philip Durbro, and he had run Landor Associates' corporate identity practice for many years and was something of a leading thinker in the area of corporate identity. And I found that I really understood his approach and his way of thinking, and I fit right in. And so, as it turns out, the innate talent and uh, the thread that fueled my interest this whole whole way was storytelling. And now you and Philip run Marshall together. That's right. That's right. So Philip and I, we sold Frankfurt Balkind and started Marshall Strategy together to focus really on the core strategy behind brands and not to necessarily get sidetracked or or distracted in some cases by the creative or the executional opportunities those come those kind of come next but what really fueled you know my my transition from where i came from to where i am now was this this idea of storytelling it was it turns out it's a critical skill in brand consulting I was lucky enough that Philip became a mentor to me and helped me really understand the discipline, but mm-hmm. um, I was able to apply my academic and, and personal passions to it. And so it really was sort of a natural progression for me, even though, it, like I said, when I first went to college, it was nothing I had ever <laughs> even imagined I would be doing. I want to talk about brand experience a little bit. Do you or Marshall have a definition of that phrase or just kind of a working definition in terms of how you would deliver on on something like brand experience to a to a client? We do. And actually our definition of brand experience has to start with our definition of brand mm-hmm. because as you know there there's so <laughs> many different perspectives on that particular word. We define brand as the intersection of promise and perception. Ah. Uh, if you can make a clear and ownable promise to the world, you're going to set certain expectations and you're going to create certain perceptions. When you deliver on that promise, the expectations are met and your brand starts to take on meaning. It starts to um, to take on that emotional quality that so many brands, especially um, high-performing brands, are known for. And so brand experience then becomes all the different ways in which you make that promise real. It's in the way you talk about it. It's in your presence across touch points. And it's about the process of successful promise fulfillment when a customer or other stakeholder interacts with you. And so it's kind of evolved from that just, you know, brand being a mark of quality to brand experience being a way in which a promise can actually live out in the real world. 
And uh, obviously, you know, technology and entertainment and the way society operates have offered up so many new opportunities for a brand to make its promise either real or virtually felt in ways that haven't been done before. Now, if those aren't orchestrated or coordinated, then there is no experience because right. it's fragmented, it's chaotic. But if they are orchestrated and coordinated, that experience can be very deep, it can be very real, it can be very memorable, and it can be completely ownable. So in terms of making it orchestrated and coordinated, and, and also just ensuring that you're doing a good job creating a, a consistent and powerful experience for a client's brand, do, do you have any kind of approach that you consistently take or any rules of thumb? Just, just how do you make sure that you're you're doing that in a way that's, that's, I suppose, less haphazard than just picking a few touch points and saying, well, let's try to make the experience as, as quote unquote good as we can or, or deliver on this yeah. promise as effectively as we can on, on these three touch points? Yeah, great question because brand experience, while it can be very exciting, can also be overdone. Yeah. Or it can be done in a way that's just superficial and doesn't enable someone to really understand or interact with a brand in the way that you would like them to. So we always start with brand definition. What promise or promises is this brand making? And it's it's kind of astounding sometimes when you get into an organization and you realize that they're, they're not real clear on the promise that they're making. Or they're making so many promises that there's, there's no real rhyme or reason to it. And it's very difficult to, to get a sense of why this organization exists. And so that's the first thing is, do we have a clear definition of what this promise is? Have we articulated or delivered on those promises in the past? And if not, how can we do a better job of that? How does this promise and that discipline compare with others in the industry? And what are the needs and perceptions of key audiences? This is all really fundamental sort of brand platform type right. work, but it really informs the uh, effectiveness of a brand experience. Uh, because if these parts are not clear, it becomes hard to define a brand experience, a meaningful brand experience. It doesn't stop many from trying, though. <laughs> so that's step one. I want to pause on step one for a second, just because uh, sure. it, it was really a lot of last season I was discussing brand platforms specifically. But since you've brought it up, I'm curious what Marshall's approach to brand platform is, or if you have something that you're using consistently. You know, there are a lot of different frameworks and, and models out there, some of which include the same sort of components like brand personality and brand pillars and others seem to diverge from that quite a bit. Are you guys using something consistently that you can talk about or is it really tailored to the client? The simplest framework we use for developing a brand platform is also the one we use the most. It's just answering three direct questions. Who are you? What do you do? And why do you matter? Mm -hmm. And uh, the third question, why do you matter, is the hardest to answer in an ownable way. I mean, fundamentally, it's about what would happen if this brand went away? What would the world be missing? Right. You, Of course, you have to layer on top of those three questions, competitive differentiation, a sustainable promise that's not simply a, a, a moment-based or trend-based statement. It has to be believable. People have to be motivated to deliver. It has to be beneficial to customers. But just thinking about it in very simple terms, in terms of who forces you to be simple and straightforward. Okay. Any other framework, like a brand pyramid, brand pillars, brand house, we think of those as good starting places. Right. But we think that it's important to distill further than that, because if you can answer the questions I posed earlier in prose, in a sentence or a couple of sentences, that's when it begins to mean something. That's when it begins to become that story rather than a framework or a, or a set of principles. So taking then the answers to those three questions or whatever it is you've done to really define the brand, let's go back to brand experience. Do you have any kind of way of categorizing just potential areas that a brand experience could come to life or any kind of way of checking that you've been as exhaustive as you can be or should be in terms of bringing the experience to life? Yeah. You know, if, if we've got an inspired group of people, which ideally we're trying to, to achieve, we can then begin to think about ideas. And, you know, when you have a clear promise, you can deliver a, uh, develop a long list of ideas very quickly. You think about audience, you think about touch points, you think about product, you think about customer journey and where you're actually engaging with the customer. And you can develop a long list. And it's good to keep a long list because you want to see the kind of the universe of possibilities. And then there's a particular tool that's very simple, again, but I've found very effective in prioritizing the elements that will most effectively help you orchestrate a brand experience. It's, uh, it's just a two-by-two two matrix. And on one axis, 
you have low impact and high impact. Uh And on the other axis, you have low effort and high effort. And you begin to map out all those possibilities that you've just listed into that matrix. So you're going to have, you know, low effort, high impact possibilities. You're going to have high effort, high impact possibilities. Right. You're going to have low effort, low impact, and high effort, low impact. And if you think about it, the high effort, low impact category are things that come off the list really quickly <laughs> because they're time and resource intensive, and they don't really make much of a difference. Right. And so you're able to begin to focus in. And, and effort in this case includes cost, I assume, too. Effort includes cost, yes. It includes yeah. uh, resource allocation. It includes, in some cases, credibility. You know, how hard are we going to have to push our customer or the world to believe that we can do this? Right. So effort does sort of take a, a bit of a definition within whatever category you're working. And that also helps, you know, create some discipline around planning and, and identifying those best opportunities. Right. And then the other three quadrants, I'm curious, do those do those quadrants just become a way of prioritizing the other things on the list? And do you always recommend high impact, low effort first because it's sort of the easiest way out of the gate? Not necessarily. Usually in the high impact, high effort category, there are several opportunities that if you're willing to invest, you can really establish an ownership very quickly. And so it becomes a bit of a judicious process where you discuss, you know, relative risk, competitive environment, available investment, and things like that. And, you know, once you know your customer, you're able to help them facilitate decisions that help them balance that out. So in in all reality, you're most likely to, you're most likely going to have a combination of low effort, high impact, high effort impact, and maybe even some low effort, low impact that are easy to do and simply reach people in a very simple way. I mean, I would say most social media outreach programs are low effort, low impact. Mm -hmm. And you can't ignore them. You've got to be there, but uh, you don't want to do it all in that quadrant. Sort of table stakes. Yeah, exactly. I don't want to put you on the spot too much here, but I'm just wondering as you're as you're talking through this, do you, do you have any examples of things you've helped clients come up with on on this kind of two by two or, or a list of things to do to help create a brand experience? Sure, we did this recently with a real estate client of ours mm-hmm. who uh, is pretty big in the Bay Area and has a, a pretty widespread presence, but it wasn't very visible because they weren't using the same brand everywhere; they were using different brands. And the decision, they made the decision with our assistance to consolidate everything behind one brand and one promise. And then the question became, what are our available ways in which we can make this promise real? And, you know, it had something to do with the promise itself, which was really about creating a vibrant living experience in San Francisco. And so how could they demonstrate that vibrancy? Well, it just so happened they didn't just own apartments. They opened, they owned shops and restaurants and bars. And so a very low effort, high impact way for them to start to make this promise was to show up in those areas where people gather mm-hmm. and not just show up in, uh, you know, with a, with a, a window cling, but to show up in a real physical or even live way to have, you know, sponsor performances or, um, you know, bring their own people together to, to demonstrate a new, a new community-based effort that they were making. When it came to higher effort, higher impact offerings, it had to do with investing in new technology for their website so they could deliver a more real-to-life experience. For example, when someone's looking for an apartment, how can you make that tour of the apartment before they actually see it as real as possible? Right. And so there were a number of different ways. And there were also some high effort efforts which involved using their own people to go to each of these apartments and hold town hall style meetings with the tenants. That's high effort because you're using your own internal resources and you've right. got you know, hundreds of properties. And so it does take time. But the impact was immediate because it's people to people. And uh, so it became important to them. Great. Today's episode is brought to you by Rev.com, offering fast, affordable, accurate audio transcription and captions. I like to use Rev to transcribe episodes of this podcast and also for recorded interviews that I conduct during brand strategy projects. I've tried a few others and keep coming back to Rev because their transcriptions are accurate and their turnaround time is super fast, 24 hours sometimes, and transcriptions are just a dollar a minute. Right now, Rev is offering listeners of this show $10 off your first order. To get that $10 off coupon, visit rev.com slash blog slash HBAB for how brands are built. Again, that's rev.com slash blog slash HBAB. Rev, transcriptions made simple. This episode is also brought to you by Squad Help, the world's number one naming platform. Here's how Squad Help works. 
You launch a naming contest to engage hundreds of naming experts. You're guided through an agency-level naming process that goes beyond traditional crowdsourcing. The platform uses AI and includes name validation features such as audience testing, trademark validation, linguistic analysis, and quality scoring. And Squad Help doesn't just do naming. You can use their platform for taglines or slogans, as well as logo design. To launch your naming contest today, go to squadhelp.com and start receiving custom name suggestions instantly. Squad Help, company, brand, and business name ideas by experts. Today's episode is also brought to you by Audible. For listeners of How Brands Are Built, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the chance to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash HBAB for How Brands Are Built. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash HBAB to get your free audiobook today. Now, back to the conversation with Ken Pasternak. I want to play a little bit of audio from a video I found, I think, through your website of you talking about creating brand identities for large, complex organizations. I'll play some of the audio and then ask you a couple of questions about it. Okay. Marshall Strategies' approach to identity for large complex organizations is to first identify the connective tissue that unites the different initiatives and the aspirations of the organization, because that's where the power of identity really lies. Once we've done that, we articulate the identity in ways that everyone, from management on down, can really see themselves in that core idea. When we look at identity strategy, especially for large complex organizations, a real sign of success is when you see people acting in ways that bring that identity to life. So in the video, you said articulate the identity in ways that everyone from management on down can really see themselves in that core idea. Can you just expand on that thought a little? What what would the articulation look like or sound like? Well, this isn't my answer, but when you get it right, you know it. <laughs> and I know that, 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 that brand agencies hate clients saying, I'll know it when I see it. <laughs> but what I mean by that is when you start to hear people saying it back to you or repeating your story using your words or using your ideas or discussing it in a way that makes perfect sense to them, you've hit the jackpot. I'll use a couple of my clients to describe this, and I'll use another example that I think does it or did it so well that they really blew everybody else out of the water. We did a project for UC Berkeley a number of years ago, Mm -hmm. and UC Berkeley is a top public research university. They excel on many fronts, but they're also buffeted by economic realities and challenges from being a public university such that people were worried about their future. And what we were trying to help them do is create a reason to believe that they will continue to excel into the future. And it became very apparent very early that we couldn't rely on facts and figures and status and rankings to do that, because every great university has facts and figures and status and rankings. At UC Berkeley, we identified their culture as the primary reason to believe in the future of UC Berkeley, because it's an unusual and absolutely unique culture. And we distilled that culture down to two words, which was challenging convention. Uh The story basically was UC Berkeley reimagines the world by challenging convention to shape the future. We will not live by the status quo. We will always be pushing the envelope, whether it's free speech or, you know, astrophysics or economic measurements. They will be doing that. And when we went to the trustees with this story, the head of the board of trustees said, this is like looking in a mirror. (laughs) I I, I believe that this is who we are and this is who we've always been, and I'm so glad that we get to tell this story. That's when we knew we had it right. Yeah. And I want to use another example that I think is just terrific and is not my client, but I I always look to as someone who got it right and helped other people understand it. And that was Virgin America. Right. They, uh, I've experienced it many times. I'm sure many of your listeners have experienced it many times before they were acquired by um, Alaska. But everything that they did was intended to do something very simple, which was make flying good again and to make you feel good about flying as a passenger. And everybody, it seems, within the organization got that and knew what the right thing was to do to make that happen. For example, when I first flew Virgin America, I noticed in the security line that they were playing lounge music. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, have I ever actually heard music in the security line at all? (laughs) No, I never had. And it instantly made me feel more relaxed. The tension of that particular waiting in line experience went away. It's like being at Disneyland. And then there were the airplane interiors. Yeah. The innovative entertainment and food service portal that they had, uh, the attendance, their dress, their attitude, their friendliness, even the safety video, which yeah. I preferred the cartoon to the musical number myself. <laughs> I don't think I've seen the cartoon. I, I know the musical number very well. Oh, the cartoon well. was great. 
great. Yeah, I have to look it up on YouTube. It was terrific. And it all, it, it was all service delivery, but it was all customer experience. And, 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 you know, it goes to the website, the app, the advertising, it goes on. It was all designed to deliver a unique promise that began with Sir Richard Branson and his ideas around the world, yeah. about the world, and the fact that Virgin America could make, could make flying good again and make people feel good about flying. And it was such a clear promise that the experience that delivered it seemed effortless. I'm sure it was, you know, years and years of work and investment. Yeah. But I would say that was a great example of showing how everyone from management on down can see themselves an idea. They want to be a part of that idea and they can figure out how to make it real. Every single point of the customer journey. Yeah. The Virgin example is, is, is great in that it, at least as far as I can think of, and from what you just said, there wasn't necessarily anything that they added to the experience, kind of the, the chain of events of that, that we've all been through a million times of booking a flight, standing in line, getting on the plane. They just thought about each and every point along that journey really, really carefully and, and came up with ideas of how to improve a lot of them, if not all of them. I, I think having having done this a few times with clients, we, we put pressure on ourselves sometimes to come up with something new or disruptive or, or innovative mm -hmm. when, when at least as far as I can think of with Virgin, it, it, they really just, they didn't have to do that in order to, to create a really unique experience. No, it was really, you know, what are the different points of tension along the way? And how can we loosen that tension by putting a little swing in it? Yeah. And that's what they did. And they did it with conviction and they did it with commitment and they did it with a little bit of snark. And for them, that was the right thing. And uh, it turned out to be, in my opinion, and in many travelers' opinions, probably the best thing any airline had done outside of Southwest Airlines mm -hmm. in terms of making a, a complete experience. I just flew on, on an Alaska flight a couple of days ago, and it was a virgin plane that they were in the process of rebranding to Alaska, and they had, they had put a uh -huh. sticker on the outside saying, please sort of pardon our dust while we Alaska-fy. They, they used that, they created that verb, Alaska-fy this plane, and I just thought, is there really, are there, is there an audience for this? Are there people that really want the plane to be Alaska-fied? I feel like maybe they should just yeah. leave it alone and, uh, you know, get on the plane, and it still had the, uh, the, what is, what is it, purple uh, hue on purple the... Purple and pink. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which was, which was nice, but I wish they would just leave it that way. I just flew Alaska yesterday, as a matter of fact, and, and to me, to Alaskify is to suck the soul right back out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it seemed, it seemed it, to, be, to me that they had a real lack of awareness about the equity or associations between the two brands. I, at the very least, they could have just kept quiet about it, I think. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I've learned a little bit about this because I was so troubled by the acquisition and what it meant for the, the Virgin brand and experience that went with it. And what I've learned is that Alaska runs an incredibly profitable airline. Ah. They really know how to pull the levers to run the business in a profitable way. But I still maintain that if you're playing the long game, brand experience is as critical to your survival as is smart business and profitable business. And I think that in the case of Alaska versus Virgin, they've overcorrected it in favor of the business process right. and not in favor of the brand experience. And you see that a lot in airlines, especially those who are still trying to catch up. But to me, that just speaks so strongly about why brand experience can be fundamentally important. You know, Dis Disney is another brand with a terrific brand experience. Mm -hmm. From the quality of their franchises to the way they deliver a park experience. You know, anyone with kids will probably has a closet full of costumes from Frozen, first of all. <laughs> how did you know? And they probably also marvel <laughs> at how easy it can do you. <laughs> yep. And my my uh, daughter just did her uh, wish list for her four-year-old birthday party, and it's basically all dresses from all different Disney princesses. So <laughs> it's, <amazing. laughs> it's an expensive list. And they get them early. And, and they, you know, you marvel at how easy it is to stand 45 minutes in line for a three-minute three ride because they make it fun. They, make, they right. deliver quality entertainment every time you get, go into contact with them. And it doesn't matter whether you're an ESPN fan or whether you're a, a, a Lucasfilm Galaxy, you know, inhabitant or you're a, a young princess. It's a terrific brand experience across the board. And why? Because they understand what their promise is, and they've invested in making that promise as real as they can every time they can. Great. Well, I want to do a couple of wrap-up questions with you, Ken, and some sure. of these are questions I've asked a lot of guests. I love having sort of a cross-section of people that I've asked uh, some of these these questions. So you've just mentioned a couple of brands that that have great brand experiences. Thinking more broadly just about brand in general, 
Are there any other brands that you would point to, whether they're big brands like Disney and Virgin or ones that that you know in your personal life but feel like maybe are, uh, others are not as familiar with that you just feel like as a brand person, you look at that brand and think, wow, they, they really seem to get everything or 99% of, of this brand thing right? You know, on the B2B side, um, Salesforce has done an amazing job of building a community of fanatical users and supporters. Mm -hmm. And they've done that not just by making cloud-based software. And in fact, people would argue that their cloud-based software may not be the most modern and exciting cloud-based software out there. But they've done it by enabling people to build their businesses on Salesforce. And by doing that, the brand experience itself is business success. And so, you know, Salesforce calls themselves a customer success story, and they've actually made their customers successful by helping them build their businesses on Salesforce. And so it's, it's become such a terrific brand experience because it's got both economic and emotional benefits that their, their community, their ecosystem has just grown by orders of magnitude. If you've ever been to Dreamforce in San Francisco, it takes over the entire city. Yeah. And the spirit, the energy, and the excitement that comes with it. I mean, this is just cloud-based sales software, but the excitement <laughs> around it is it's a lifestyle thing. And I think that's a tribute to Salesforce's focus on their promise and identification on, on what experiences we're going to make that promise most real for its stakeholders and customers. My experience with Dreamforce is mostly the traffic that it creates in San Francisco, so I know what you mean <laughs> when you say it takes over. Is there anything I, I'm just thinking about my kind of interaction with the brand, which again is mostly just being someone who lives in the Bay Area, but they seem to be really involved sure. locally in, in the community. And I know that their CEO has been somewhat outspoken about some sort of political aspects of, of things going on in the Bay Area, um, but also just their their physical buildings are so <laughs> impressive. Is there anything along oh, yeah. those lines? Yeah. Anything along those lines that you feel like they that they've done that that helps build the brand at least locally? Well, I think that's a great point that you make, which is that your visibility and your and your activity in the community or in the communities in which you're present do make a big difference. And in fact, brand experience could also be which events, community other, or otherwise, you choose to sponsor and be present at, right. or which causes are you willing to support. Yeah. You know, people of a certain political persuasion are not too proud of chick Fillet these days, and, and people of another political persuasion are very proud of chick Fillet because they've decided that their brand is about particular uh, social programs that they right. support or don't support. And so in the case of Salesforce, yes, they've, they've taken a real strong stand. They support the community. Another brand that could probably benefit from its community involvement and actually has been very strong in the community for many years is Wells Fargo. Uh -huh. Here in the Bay Area, Wells Fargo is a prominent sponsor for many community-oriented arts and education programs. And I've taken notice. It's, yeah. it's important to me that they do that. And so I think it is an important dimension to brand experience that um, shouldn't be ignored. In fact, it can, it can make a big difference as long as it's sincere and authentic. Right. I was just going to say on, on the Wells Fargo, I think the unfortunate thing is that even if it is sincere because of some of the other uh, stories they've had in the news lately, it, it can it can feel like they're doing it defensively or something like that. And, and it is, it's right. easy to get cynical about things like this from big brands. but. That's probably a whole separate conversation about yeah. the, the right way and wrong way to, to go about that. Yeah, but I, I think you're right. I mean, sincerity and credibility are important. And uh, that's one of the key criteria for any brand experience is not only, you know, are we fulfilling our promise, but are we fulfilling our, our promise credibly? Are we living up to what we're saying we believe in? And does this execution or this service decision or this investment that we're making back it up? Great. Back to my, we, we digressed a little bit there, but back to my, my wrap up sure. questions. So two more, just any book recommendations, anything sort of even, you know, tangentially related to, to branding or, or how you think about branding that, that you want to recommend? It's funny. Uh, and it's a little bit embarrassing. I've been in this business a long time as a practitioner, but it's been a long time since I've read many books on the subject. So a, a general answer to uh, book recommendations would be anything by Trout and Rees. And yeah. they've come out in many, many different editions. And they've always got an authenticity to them and a simplicity to them. They're good reads and they use real-world examples. And it's always good to think about just what's the principles behind any brand experience. Mm -hmm. And then a more specific example that I read, again, just recently, is called Groundswell by uh -huh. Charlene Lee. I don't know that one. And it's about the rise of social media and its influence on society and how people interact with it. And it speaks to the, one of the more challenging touch points that shape brand experience these days. 
It's, you know, it's the social landscape is the fastest moving, it's the hardest to corral, and therefore it's the most dependent on simplicity and clarity at the core, followed by a sound brand experience strategy, because if you can't control the ground-level social channel, it really becomes a problem for you. If, you. if your brand story is clear, if your promise is clear, your brand experience is much more thoughtful and thought through, the social experience actually reinforces it, even when you fall down. So Groundswell is a great way of looking at that from multiple angles. Great. I, I keep a running list of these book recommendations from, from interview guests, so that one will be added to the list soon. Thank you. Great. And then last question, any, any advice for people looking to get into brand consulting if they're not already in it or just people trying to progress or grow in their career? One thing that I experienced that I think was really helpful, and I didn't do this actively, but it turned out to be good for me, was to. I ended up at a smaller firm. And when you're at a smaller firm, you may not work on the big brands quite as often, but your exposure to the real work and to senior executives within client organizations will be that much greater. Mm-hmm. And I think it took me into areas where I was looking at and, and helping solve big questions very early in my career. And it helped me gain a maturity and a, and a point of view and a perspective that I might not have gotten had I start, started at an entry-level position with a large, large organization. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, a second thing I would say is consider starting in a research role. Mm-hmm. Because in research, you can become an authority on information that your client didn't know before, which is hugely valuable for them. So it doesn't matter whether you have years of experience behind you or not. You have the information. Um, And then the third one I would say is if you can find a mentor, whether it's through a university network, a business or personal connections, LinkedIn, even someone you can shadow for a while, even without pay, it can be extremely valuable at any stage in your career, but particularly when you're getting started out. Great. Well, Ken, I should mention that you've been somewhat of a mentor to me in my career, so I appreciate that and I uh, appreciate the advice as well and and can vouch for it. Thank you so much for the conversation and for uh, all of your insights. Well, thank you, Rob. I appreciate your saying that, and I'm really glad to be included, and I hope that this is helpful. Very much so. Thanks, Ken. Thank you, Rob. Thanks for listening to How Brands Are Built. If you liked the episode, I hope you'll go to Apple Podcasts and leave a five-star rating and a review. To learn more about Ken and Marshall Strategy, visit marshallstrategy.com. While you're there, I highly recommend you check out their blog. It's full of insightful, useful articles. Most recently, Ken's partner, Philip, who you heard him mention just now, published a great article about what's changed and what hasn't in his over 30 years in the brand identity world. I'll also post my notes from the interview with Ken, the video that we played a clip from, and a full transcript at howbrandsarebuilt.com. Also at howbrandsarebuilt.com, you can check out some recent blog posts and don't forget to sign up for the newsletter. It only comes out about once a month. It always contains some branding news as well as links to recent content on the site. And sometimes there's even a free download. Please check that out. How Brands Are Built is a production of Heirloom Agency, LLC. Our theme music is by Isha Erskine Project. I'm Rob Meyerson, and I'll talk to you next time.